Well, if you are new to our church, you might not realize that uh, what you've seen uh, a little bit earlier and just now during the offering time are snippets of um, this summer up at Camp Zion, our church camp in Door County, Wisconsin. Uh, another group of uh, junior hires went up on the bus just this morning, so among other things you could pray about this week would be pray for the leaders of that camp group um, and the campers. Um, we are uh, grateful that we've gotten off to a good start and you've seen uh, a sampling of our earliest two camp periods. Now we turn our attention to the Word of God and the parables of Jesus. Let me invite you to scroll or open your Bibles to Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7 for the first in our series of stories Jesus told, um, a series on the parables. The Pharisees... I have to interrupt you right there. <laughs> when you read the word Pharisees or hear the word Pharisees, you may very well think of the bad guys in the gospel stories. But that was not the impression that uh, the first hearers of Jesus would have had. The Pharisees were among the most respected members of the community. A friend of mine at Denver Seminary many years ago took one course at the local Jewish seminary. It was taught by a rabbi who, uh, during his, one of his early lectures, said to um, the mostly Baptist student group, um, I am what you Baptists would call a Pharisee somebody who takes the law of God seriously. That's what people heard in the first century when they heard the word Pharisee. So what about the Pharisees? Well, the Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus and saw that some of his disciples were eating food with unclean, that is, ceremonially unwashed hands. The Pharisees and all of the Jews do not eat unless they have given their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups, pitchers, kettles. You know, probably that parenthetical explanation tells us that Mark anticipated a lot of non-Jewish readers of his gospel. Some of the earliest followers of our Lord Jesus were Jewish, but many were not, and Mark is explaining something about Jewish tradition for those who wouldn't have known from their own personal experience. So the Pharisees and the teachers of the law asked Jesus, why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders? instead of eating their food with unclean hands. He replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. You've let go of the commands of God and are holding on to the traditions of men. And he said to them, you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. For Moses said, honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses his father or mother must be put to death. But you say that if a man says to his father or mother, whatever help you might otherwise have received from me is Corbin, that is, a gift devoted to God. You probably ought to explain that. Um, it was possible for a devoted uh, Jew to set aside part of his income or anticipated income as devoted to God. Nobody could spend it. Nobody could touch it. It was for the temple, for um, the priests to dispose of as they saw fit. And the word for this um, setting aside was korban. Whatever help you might otherwise have received from me is Corbin. Uh, then you no longer let him do anything for his father or mother. Thus, you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you've handed down, and you do many things like that. Again, Jesus called the crowd to him, and he said, Listen to me, 
everyone and understand this. Nothing outside a man can make him unclean by going into him. Rather, it is what comes out of a man that makes him unclean. After he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about this parable. Notice that uh, they call this short statement by Jesus a parable. Now, usually when we hear the word parable, we think of a story, the Good Samaritan, uh, the prodigal son. But the Bible uses the parable in a broader sense. It includes shorter statements, figurative statements uh, like this one. Are you so dull, he asked? Don't you see that nothing that enters a man from the outside can make him unclean? For it doesn't go into his heart, but into his stomach, and then out of his body. And in saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. Now, if you read the book of Acts, you will discover or have discovered that one of the controversies of the early church was whether Gentile followers of Jesus needed to adopt Jewish practices, including a kosher diet. Mark, writing at that time, shows that Jesus settled that question. He went on, what comes out of a man is what makes him unclean. For from within, out of men's hearts come the evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and make a man unclean. Today and in the weeks to come, we will honor our Lord Jesus by paying careful attention to what he says in the parables and living accordingly. Another way we will honor the Lord Jesus is by singing his praises. Let's do that. Stand as we sing. Will you pray with me? Our exalted, majestic, worthy Lord Jesus Christ. Among other lyrics we have just sung, were these words. We want to give you all our attention. To that end, we petition your Father and our Father for this grace. May the words of my mouth, the meditation of all of our hearts, be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. In Mark chapter 7, Jesus seems to be in an uncharacteristically cranky mood. When the most respected members of his community ask him a question, he snaps back, calling them hypocrites in front of a crowd, and so humiliating them, and not exactly improving his already rocky relationship with the religious establishment. Then when his friends ask him a question a few minutes later, he responds, are you really so dumb? What's going on here? Well, one Christian author commenting on these paragraphs thinks he understands. He himself, years ago, wrote a magazine article in which he took the evangelical church to task about some of our weaknesses and he got mail. This is in the day of snail mail, um, responding to the article. The first letter that he opened um, commended him for writing with, quote, the pen of a prophet. He'd never been complimented that way before and was feeling pretty good. He opened the second envelope, and without so much as the courtesy of a greeting, the writer said, you're the voice of the devil. So his emotions plummeted from the highest of the high to the lowest of the low with two swipes of a letter opener. Perhaps Jesus felt that way. In Mark chapter 6, he was riding a wave of popularity. Large crowds came eager to hear him preach. He performed a miracle feeding 5,000 men plus women and children. He walked on water and then... We come to chapter 7, where critics niggle at him and his disciples misunderstand him. Is, that's what, is that 
what's eating Jesus? I don't think so. I, I think that something else is going on here, something that not only explains Jesus' apparent crankiness, but which revolutionizes our religious outlook. And I don't use that word revolutionizes lightly. A respected New Testament scholar says of today's text, this is well nigh the most revolutionary passage in the New Testament. Mark chapter 7, verse 1. The Pharisees and teachers of the law come from Jerusalem. Evidently, Jesus' teaching and healing ministry had attracted a lot of attention, most of it positive, but some of it controversial, and the religious leaders thought they better head north from Jerusalem to investigate. So, do they interview people who have been healed? Do they talk to those who were fed by the miracle of the loaves and the fish? Do they interview the family of the dead girl whom Jesus raised? Do they give his teaching a hearing? No. They criticize him because his disciples didn't wash their hands before they ate. Boys and girls, do your parents bug you about washing your hands before you come to the supper table? <laughs> I read about one kid who was called for dinner and his mother added, don't forget to wash your hands. And a guest overheard him muttering, Jesus and germs, Jesus and germs. That's all I ever hear about, and I've never seen either one of them. <laughs> the first century readers of Mark's gospel didn't know everything that we know about germs. Washing here in this chapter is not so much about hygiene not solely anyway, it's more about ritual purity. Old Testament law said that um, priests had to wash their hands before ministering in the tabernacle or the temple. It, it was a way of saying that if you are going to worship a holy God, you don't want to come dirty. And in Jesus' day, it had become a tradition for all Jews to wash before meals to symbolize the same truth. We are a holy people. We serve a holy God. And we don't want to come into his presence dirty. Not a bad tradition, really. And, you know, we need traditions for all of life, but including the worship of God. Otherwise, we would have to think from scratch every time we came to worship about how are we going to do this? How are we going to show reverence for God? Well, we have a tradition of bowing our heads when we pray. How are we going to express gratitude for all God's gifts? Well, we have a tradition, many of us, of saying grace before every meal. The Bible doesn't say that you have to do things this way. These are just ways of doing what the Bible does say. And so, intercession time and watch night services and age-graded Sunday school and postludes and communion on the first Sunday of the month and dipping somebody three times when you baptize them and camp reflections, uh, these are not commanded by the Bible, but they do help us live out our life before God. It's a good thing. Traditions are a good thing unless, unless we elevate our traditions to the authority of the inspired Word of God. Uh, I think of a small town church in upstate New York. An Episcopal church had been served by the same rector for 35 years. When he retired, a, a young minister came to that parish. It was his first assignment. He was eager to do a good job. But um, after a few weeks, he had a feeling that something was wrong. Something, something was not right, that his people were upset with him. 
And, and so he, he took aside one of the lay leaders of the church and said, I, I don't know what's wrong, but I have a feeling that something's wrong. And the man said, well, Father, that, that's true. I hate to say it, but it's the way you do the communion service. What, the way I do the communion service? I don't, I don't think I leave... I don't think I've added anything or changed anything. And the, the lay leader said, well, it's not so much as what you do as what you've left out. I don't think I leave anything out of the communion service. Oh, yes, you do. Our previous pastor, when he administered the chalice to the people, would always go over first to the radiator and touch it. Touch the radiator, the young minister said. I never heard of that. So the next day he called the former rector and said, I haven't been here even a month and I'm in trouble. In trouble? Why? Well, it's something to do with the radiator. Is that possible? D did you do that? And the former pastor said, oh yeah, I did. Before I administered the chalice to the people, I touched the radiator to discharge static electricity so I wouldn't shock them. And so for 35 years, this untutored congregation thought that this was a holy tradition. And um, as a consequence, they got a reputation as being the church of the holy radiator. <laughs> the Pharisees' question in Mark 7 was kind of like that of the disgruntled New Yorkers. The Pharisees weren't sincerely trying to learn. Master, we notice that your followers do things differently. Um, we, we need to learn about this. No, no. They just jump in with criticism. Of all the important things they could have inquired about, the kingdom of God, the compelling evidence that God was working miracles through Jesus, of all these important things, they focus on dirty hands. And Jesus is tough on them because they are the spiritual leaders of the nation and they care more about their traditions than the word of God. You hypocrites, he calls them in verse 6. Just like your forefathers that Isaiah encountered when he said, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. May God spare us that rebuke in worship. May he never say of me or of you, your hearts, you, you honor me with your lips, but your hearts are far from me. Verse 7, your worship is in vain. Teachings, just human rules. Sometimes people not only put tradition on a par with the Bible, sometimes they elevate tradition above the Bible. Verse 8, you have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to the traditions of men. Years ago, a seminary professor was challenged on his teaching on a particular belief, and he mustered one passage of Scripture after another to prove his point, but his critics said, in frustration, that may be the Bible, but it's not Baptist. Well, the example that Jesus gives is this Corban tradition. Whatever its origin may have been, whatever good intentions those who started it may have had, it was used in Jesus' day to circumvent the plain teaching of Scripture that parents are to be honored. So some people were saying of money that they could have used to help their ailing parents, to provide for their aging parents. Oh, that's Corban. Now, maybe they weren't really intending to ever give it to the priests. Maybe they weren't intending to ever use it for a more spiritual purpose, but what they for sure weren't doing was obeying the Bible. 
And Jesus says in verse 13, you do many things like that. Many ways in which you let go of God's word so that you can hold on to your traditions. And I wonder, what would Jesus say about our traditions? I, I've seriously pondered that over the last few days as I prepared to preach this text and wondered whether we have any traditions that we elevate above God's word. I, I don't think so. I'm sure that probably some traditions matter more to us than they should, and that if we went about changing some of them, people would squawk and maybe even be more upset than if they heard heresy preached from the pulpit. But I don't think that there are areas in which we set aside God's word so that we can hold on to our traditions instead. If so, may God show us and give us grace to repent. Jesus said that his critics did that sort of thing a lot. In verse 14, he gets back to the original topic. What makes you dirty? What makes you dirty? Eating with unwashed hands? Were Jesus' disciples morally, spiritually dirty because they broke with this tradition? Well, look again if you have your Bible open to verses 14 and 15. Again, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Now listen to me, everyone. Understand this. Nothing outside a man can make him dirty by going into him. Rather, it's what comes out of a man that makes him unclean or dirty. Now that's today's parable. Not a full-blown narrative, not a story, but it's called a parable, showing that the Bible uses that term a little more broadly, loosely than we typically do. The parable is not anything that is outside of a person consumed by him, including the dirt on his hands is what makes him spiritually dirty. What makes you spiritually dirty is what's on the inside. Well, the disciples didn't understand this. Verse 17, after he left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about this parable. And he said, there's no such thing as a dumb question. Uh... <laughs> Not in my Bible. Verse 18, his response is, are you really so dull? Cranky? Does Jesus need a nap? Or did he maybe fear that his followers were still too much like the Pharisees in their thinking? The disciples had been with Jesus when, in chapter 1, he touched an untouchable leper. When, in chapter 2, he hung around tax collectors and sinners. When he broke with the established traditions about fasting. When he broke established Sabbath traditions in order to heal people on that sacred day. When, in Mark chapter 5, he allowed a ritually unclean woman to touch him. They had heard Jesus come to their defense just a couple minutes earlier with a stinging rebuke to the Pharisees. How can they not get it? <laughs> so Jesus has a right to be short with them. And Jesus has a right to be short with us. <laughs> because with the benefit of hindsight and 2,000 years of hearing this story, the church still fails to get it right sometimes. Fortunately, Jesus didn't give up on them, and he doesn't give up on us. He explains again patiently, <laughs> verse 18, don't you see? Don't you see that what enters a man from outside can't make him unclean? It doesn't go into his heart but into his stomach and then out of his body. Uh, the New International Version is being 
a little gentle here. Literally, the Greek says it goes out into the latrine. What makes you dirty? Not eating with unwashed hands. Not eating pork or shellfish. Verse 20, what comes out of a man is what makes him unclean. What makes you and I unclean? Not touching a leper or hanging around with people who don't know Jesus yet. Or failure to keep somebody's tradition. Again, it's what comes out of a man that makes him unclean. In Matthew's version of this story, it reads, what comes out of a man's mouth comes from his heart and makes him unclean. From within, out of the heart, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. Uh, takes more than a cup of water poured over your hands to clean up that list. Nancy Ortberg tells about going shopping one year at Christmas time. It's kind of close to the holiday. She realized there were a couple things that she still hadn't picked up, and she went to the mall, and as you know, uh, the mall is crowded at Christmas time, including the parking lot. She drove around and around looking for a parking spot, finally spotted an old couple walking very slowly to their car, and thought, if I follow them down the row and wait for them to get in their car, that parking spot will be mine. So she waited with her blinker on. The couple got their gifts in the trunk. The man opened the door for his wife. She thought, this is no time for chivalry. Get in the car and go. And they pulled out slowly, and as she was about to turn in, a beat-up old van pulled in front of her and took the spot. I'm going to let her tell it in her words. She says, I got out of my car and had a chat with the driver. Had my mother been there, she would have washed my mouth out with soap. I chatted so long and hard and with such interesting words that he backed out of the parking space. And I felt good initially. I thought, I stood up for my rights. I'm pretty feisty. But then a verse came into my head that says, the things that come out of the mouth come from the heart, and these make a man unclean. And the painful truth, she continues, is the Bible says the condition of my heart is reflected by what comes out of my mouth and how I live my life, and I came to the conclusion that I was wrong I told God that my actions and words did indeed reflect the condition of my heart, and I wasn't proud of it. Why did that New Testament scholar I quoted early call this text revolutionary? Because almost all religions locate dirt on the outside and come up with ways to deal with with that, rules, lists, traditions, ceremonies. This is how you can be clean, right with God. Obey the rules, respect the lists, keep the traditions, observe the ceremonies. Oh, if only it were so easy. The sobering truth is that nothing less than a new heart will do. Israel's prophets looked forward to a day when God would put a new heart in his people. Jesus called it being born again. He comes into your life, makes you clean on the inside, gives you his spirit to take up residence there and purify your heart day by day. Researchers at the University of Toronto published data about 15 years ago that suggests people 
experience a powerful urge to wash themselves when suffering from a guilty conscience. This urge is known as the Macbeth effect from that scene uh, where Lady Macbeth says, out, out, damned spot, trying to wash a blood stain that's only in her head. Well, in order to study this effect, the researchers asked volunteers or invited volunteers to just think about some immoral act they had committed in the past, shoplifting, um, betraying a friend, or so on. And then the volunteers were offered the opportunity to wash their hands. And according to this study, the people who had retraced their sins were twice as likely to accept the invitation to wash. And interestingly, that act of washing did relieve the guilt of some volunteers, at least temporarily. After deciding whether or not to wash, the subjects who had felt guilty were given a chance to volunteer for an upcoming charity event, and those who washed their hands were far less likely to volunteer than those who didn't wash. Maybe that explains why Jesus was so hard on the people who got it wrong in Mark chapter 7. Because the people who get it wrong tell us that what makes us dirty is on the outside. I can get rid of guilt by washing my hands. <laughs> as long as I believe that, I'll never be clean before God. We're going to pray again, but we're going to sing our prayer. I'll invite you to stand and make the words of this prayer your own.